in one of our earlier videos, we introduced the notions of fair value accounting and accounting at cost. I'm sure you know the difference. If there are any doubts, please feel free to rewind the videos and clear your doubts. To keep things simple, we did not mention one important detail, and I kind of feel bad about that, so I'm going to share it here. US GAAP does not allow fair value accounting. There have been considerable talks about the need of convergence between IFRS and US GAAP. However, there are still notable differences, and this is one of them. So, the US GAAP does not allow fair value accounting, but the IFRS does. Companies can choose to opt for fair value accounting for their fixed assets when there is a clear market for these assets and a valuation exercise can be carried out. If companies choose to use fair value accounting, they have to apply the revaluation model, which consists in appraising the asset periodically, most often on an annual basis. Very similarly to what we said for impairment tests, a specialized appraiser will value the asset and will determine its current market value. Of course, we can have two possible situations. Option number one, the asset is more expensive than its current carrying amount, the amount at which it is registered on the balance sheet. In this case, we will adjust the asset's value on the balance sheet, but we will not report a gain in the firm's P&L the gain will be registered directly in equity, which is the account tied to net income. The rationale behind this is that we don't want to inflate the firm's earnings through an asset that's not even sold yet, okay? Instead, we'll account we have higher ownership claims given that the asset has appreciated in value. And we will have option number two. When the appraiser values the asset at an amount which is lower than its carrying value. In this case, we will have to report a loss in the income statement and decrease the balance sheet value of the asset. Later on, if the value of the asset continues to decrease, we will have to follow the same procedure. If, however, it starts to increase, we will be able to reverse the P&L loss and we'll be able to report an income in the P&L for the amount we've already reported as a loss earlier. We can only report as income up until the amount for which we have reported a loss previously. Afterwards, potential gains will go directly in equity without reporting a gain in the income statement. This is how the revaluation principle functions. Okay, let's consider a practical example to make things clearer. Company X owns a real estate building. For simplicity, we'll assume a zero depreciation rate. The building's carrying amount on Company X's balance sheet is $15 million. However, in 2017, the building is valued at $17 million. Okay, what happens? The company will update the fair value of $17 million on its balance sheet, right? Will it recognize a profit of $2 million? It won't. It will directly report an increase of $2 million in other comprehensive income in equity. Okay, perfect. Let's assume that the next year, 2018, the market for real estate goes down and the revaluation test indicates the building is worth $13 million. What happens? We have to record the new value of the building on our balance sheet, right? It becomes $13 million. And in addition to that, we'll report a loss of $4 million in the P&L. So the company's net income for 2018 will be $4 million lower. Okay. And finally, let's say that in 2019, the real estate market recovers slightly and the building is valued at $14 million. What happens then? Remember that we said that the revaluation method allows us to reverse previous losses and recognize them as profit in the P&L. Okay, 
the $1 million of revaluation surplus will be recognized as profit in the P&L for 2019, and the value of the building becomes $14 million on our balance sheet. I hope this example helped you understand how the revaluation model functions. This will do for now. Thanks for watching.